Question show time, your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are on my YouTube channel, if a question pops into your brain, just take a second, write it down. I gather a bunch of them up and I answer them here. All right, let's get into it. Elliot Mann 07. Hey Fraser, I love your show. And it's actually what sparked a huge interest of mine in all things space. Thank you for all of your hard work. I've been wondering, is it actually cheaper to build things like satellite dishes and telescopes in space than it is to build them on Earth and send them up? If so, why don't we build more things in space? Thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's kind of a mixed bag, right? That right now, it's easier to construct your spacecraft on Earth with human hands and, and you know, put all the bolts and screws and rivets together and test it. And if there's something wrong, then take it apart and test it again. And and then test out your mechanism that makes, say, the solar sail unfurl or the radio dish move into position. And you can test that back and forth. And as long as you can make it work in Earth gravity, you would think you're going to be able to make it work in space. Um, but there is a certain point where it just gets kind of ridiculous. And we're seeing this limit with, say, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is enormous and has to unfold its main uh, dish and then has to unfold its sun shield and all these parts have to work perfectly and the whole telescope has to be able to handle the launch it's got to be able to fit within the launch shroud of your rocket and so there's going to be a point where there's just a maximum size and there's some really interesting companies that are working on ideas of actually constructing and manufacturing objects in space enormous radio antenna uh, huge uh, like space telescopes and space stations and things like that. So uh, one of the companies called Tethers Unlimited, they've got this idea called Spider Fab, where they have this like 3D printing robot that just like builds these support trusses in space. And in fact, after I got this question, I kind of went down this rabbit hole and got so inspired that uh, we're going to do a whole episode. So the next episode after this is all going to be about space-based construction. So stay tuned. Thank you. John Little. Is the universe expanding because it's falling, rolling downhill, and accelerating towards a force at the edge of the universe? Sorry, my idea might be hard to understand. It was hard to explain in words. No, I get what you're going for. Um, you're sort of imagining like the universe is like this ball or maybe this disc. And there's some gravity or force or something that's outside of this disk and because of that gravity the universe is accelerating like a spreading pizza or a ball that's being inflated because it's being pulled on but that idea of the universe is sort of fundamentally not what's going on and a much better idea to think of the universe and I, I bring this up about every three four episodes just to try and help get this into people's brains is that imagine a three-dimensional grid uh, that just goes on in 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 all directions forever right grid all directions forever up down forward back left right and the if you imagine sort of the spaces between the grid as the universe is expanding those spaces are getting farther apart and that's happening in all directions forever so it's not like there is an, an edge of the universe it theoretically goes on forever. Now, if the universe is finite, then it all wraps. So you might go far enough to the left and you end up coming to the right. But in all cases, it's still this grid. And what we see as the observable universe is this place that is centered on us. I am seeing the observable universe from my spot here on Vancouver Island in Canada. And then as I look outward in space, I am seeing the universe backwards in time all the way out to 13.8 billion light years of time away in all directions. And that is the beginning of the universe. And I can't see any farther than that because there was no universe around beyond that time. So, uh, so when we imagine this sphere, it's not of space, it's of time. And if we could go and, and not see the universe from the perspective of time, then we would see this grid, because of course it would be no grid, but it would be look very similar, the same, everywhere we looked, in all directions, and it would just be getting less dense over time. I don't know if that helps. 
I will keep taking a crack at it every couple of weeks and we'll all get there together. Mike Doman. Hey Fraser, a couple of weeks ago I dreamt that a giant asteroid killed us all. It was pretty freaky, but in retrospect the asteroid in my dream was pretty unrealistic. This got me wondering what it would actually be like to experience something like a city killer sized asteroid coming at you. Imagine it would be really bright and then presumably the shockwave would get you before it reaches the ground. Sorry that this is so morbid. Super morbid, but it's also super fun to think about. I get it. Uh, so we don't have a lot of practical examples that we remember that we have records of an asteroid strike happening. The closest example that we can work on, say, is the one that happened in Chelyabinsk uh, like a decade ago, where there was this really, really bright meteor that, that sort of zipped through the sky, made everywhere like bright as day, and then where the people who were like the closest to it, when the shockwave hit, it smashed out all the glass in their houses and if they were and you could imagine right you would you would see this bright flash in the sky you'd walk over to your window and you'd look up and then the meteor would then the shock we would hit your glass and you just get a face full of of window right and so that's why everyone was injured nobody died but tons of people were injured by glass so scale that up think about the tunguska explosion which happened in 1908 you've got this place where something air bursted exploded and then all of the trees in the area were just knocked flat i think that is sort of the the size of the city killer that you're envisioning so i think what you would see is you'd be standing outside and you would see this incredibly bright flash like bright enough to blind you like a nuclear explosion in the sky and then you would experience all of the heat and all of the shock waves coming out of this thing that would be destroying buildings and like a really powerful wind everything would be catching on fire and it would be very bad so be very glad that these events happen very rarely and when they do they hit the ocean they hit large parts of Russia and they don't hit cities but in theory there's one out there with our name on it and so it really makes a lot of sense for us to go and and find them so uh, but it's, it's cool to think about. Suraj R. What about space flatulence? Imagine it would be terrible to let out a fart in a closed environment like the space station. Do the humans have special innerwear that filter out the gases? What about flammability? That's awesome. Um, farts on the space station. The reality is that the space station has a air recycling system and so they're constantly moving the air around producing more oxygen, soaking up the carbon dioxide and that air filtration system would be gathering up the methane from their farts as well. Uh, Darnell Clayton, I think one of the astronauts was talking about this and he said it's just like it's just like here on Earth if you're working in an office. Uh, you know, you deny accountability, uh, you blame it on uh, the pet, and everyone just gets on with their lives. Now, with the astronauts who are in a spacesuit, uh, the same thing. They've got an air recycling system that's moving the air around inside, so it, uh, you know, they might, <laughs> they might sort of smell their own fart for a second, and then the air will be uh, cleansed. They also have a like a ring around their neck, so it might be hard for gases down below to make it up into their helmet but it's not a big deal and it definitely doesn't catch on fire in this space station j blob so what about using three to five space-based telescopes for interferometry spread out evenly on a stationary orbit so they could have a larger area than possible with earth-based equivalents yes please Yes, I would love that. That would be amazing. And in fact, I did an episode about some of the canceled space missions, and one of those was the Terrestrial Planet Finder, and that's exactly what it was. It was three to five space telescopes that, that flew in formation far enough apart. They would act, using interferometry, they would act like a bigger telescope and would be able to, say, observe terrestrial planets orbiting other stars. And unfortunately, the mission was canceled, and so it's not going to fly, but I loved the idea. And one of the cool things that I've, and I've been looking into this is you could use, for example, because um, a photonic propulsion system to align your telescopes. So in other words, your telescope, your telescopes have to be so perfectly aligned that the individual wave fronts in visible light line up perfectly and so you have to be down to the you know 500 nanometers range 
And so you could shoot a laser out the side of your spacecraft that would push the spacecraft very delicately and then when you were perfectly aligned again, you could shoot a laser in the opposite direction and, and stop yourself compared to the other spacecraft. So uh, it's one idea for what you, you know, photonic propulsion. The first time that we ever see a laser as a rocket will probably be to help align telescopes in space so that they can be perfectly aligned with each other. So uh, it's on my to-do list of, of episodes to work on at some point, so I will totally get to it uh, eventually. It, I want to do an episode on interferometry, and I want to do an episode on photonic propulsion. So stay tuned. Bob Bob. If the life of the universe from its birth to the death of the last black hole was a calendar year, what date and time is it now for us 13.8 billion years in? Right, so if you look at the age of the universe right now, 13.8 billion years, that's what, a 13 followed by nine zeros, right? Yeah, so uh, thir 13 times 10 to the power of nine. Um, the last black hole is expected to evaporate after a one times 10 to the power of 100. And now that's not just 10 times as long, that is much, much, much farther. It is, we're dealing with exponents here. So if you were to think of like the age of the universe so far in a calendar year, we're not even in the first nanosecond of the calendar year compared to the amount of time that we're looking at into the far, far future. Uh, we're not even into the first day when you think about the age of things like some of the red dwarfs and white dwarf stars are going to cool down to the background temperature of the universe. So we are absolutely in the earliest stages. Now, you posted your question on YouTube and a couple of other people posted some ideas. And one thing that, that and I apologize who, who gave the answer, but it was a great one, which is that if it's the big rip, this idea that the accelerating expansion of the universe is going to tear apart the universe at a at an atomic level, it's estimated that that is going to happen in the next 80 million, 80 billion years or so. So uh, actually, we could be a quarter of the way through the calendar year if if the universe will die as a big rip, as opposed to the heat death. And if it's the heat death, then the universe will last a long, long, long time. We can't even comprehend. We barely can do the math to figure it out. Big rip, we're kind of a quarter of the way through. I'll let you know which way it turns out once we get more data. HMDN Lenovo. Ancient people love Stargate's technologies. Why you invest so tiny little in most popular human Stargate's project? I don't think anybody's investing any money at all in a human Stargate project. If you know of one, please let me know because Stargate's it's like my favorite science fiction method of travel. I don't want to use warp drives. I don't want to use a generation ship. I don't want to hibernate. I want to be able to just like walk down a plank, go into a glimmering circle and appear halfway across the universe. Yes, please. So uh, you should start. Start an investment fund into Stargates and I will gladly uh, once you've had some success, I will be happy to help you get the word out. Carl Ivory. If a black hole is so massive that not even light can exit it, how fast does something have to travel to exit? What is the escape velocity of a black hole, if any? Right, the way we always describe, the way I always describe a black hole is it's a region, right? There's like, the event horizon is the area where the escape velocity is the speed of light. And so because the escape velocity is the speed of light, it's black because it is literally absorbing all radiation that's falling into it. It's absorbing its own radiation. And so you would think, well, you could just go faster than the speed of light. And in fact, you could calculate the speed to go. But the problem is that actually a black hole tangles up space-time so much that all pathways lead to the singularity. They all lead back down into whatever lurks in the middle of a black hole. And so there is no speed you could go. If you could go faster than the speed of light, you would still end up in the singularity. Once you cross the escape, once you, once you cross the event horizon, there's no coming back out even if you can go faster than the speed of light. So don't do it. Stay outside of all black holes. David Agronoff. I was watching a video of GoPros on weather balloons. Is it possible to get people in orbit this way? Maybe we could 3D print ships in orbit that we meet by balloon? Why won't this work? Yeah, you can 
put a GoPro on a weather balloon and you can launch it and it can go like 30 kilometers, I think, up into the air and take an amazing view of the entire surrounding. Very cool. Uh, the problem is that going into orbit is not about getting up to a high altitude. Although I guess kind of it is if you can make it all the way to geostationary orbit, like 35,000 kilometers away. But being in low Earth orbit is all about going sideways. So when the space shuttle, when the space station are going overhead, they're moving 28,000 kilometers per hour sideways. They're only 250 nautical miles, like, th like 400 kilometers up, but they are going 28,000 kilometers per hour sideways. And what they're literally doing is they are falling, but they are falling and the Earth is curving, and so they never hit. And that's what orbit is. Orbit is just going around and around at the right speed so that you fall forever and you never hit. And so in order to use your balloon idea, you could still get high enough up where you are above the bulk of the atmosphere, but you would still need some other way to go sideways at that velocity. People have proposed that you have a balloon that, that rises up to that altitude and then there's a rocket on board that then launches and takes off and you need less fuel because you don't have to get through all of that thick atmosphere, but you still have to go sideways. So next time you watch like a SpaceX launch, because they post everything live and they show you what the velocities are, watch how that rocket, its altitude doesn't change a lot, but its sideways ground speed just goes faster and faster and faster until they reach their orbital velocity. So uh, that's why you can't take a balloon to orbit. Okay, that's it. Uh, kids are jumping in the trampoline nearby and the dogs are barking. So I'm going to cut this one short. Thanks everyone for asking all of your questions. I really appreciate it. Uh, as always, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. Let's keep yelling. <laughs> write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. I'll see you next week.